My name is Shomit Dashkupta. I'm a mathematician at Duke University. I study algebraic number theory. So being a professor has a lot of different aspects to the job. We like to think of three different aspects, uh, research, teaching, and service. So in my research component, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, new results in number theory. So sort of there's a long tradition of number theory. Uh, there's a lot of classical questions that have uh, motivated uh, branches of research, and I'm sort of working in one of these directions and trying to push the frontier. Then on the teaching side, um, there's a lot of different aspects of teaching. So I teach undergraduate and graduate classes, usually uh, upper division classes. Then I also work with graduate students who are getting their PhDs here. And then I also have uh, postdocs. And then there's service, and there's a lot of different aspects of service. So there's university service, so working on committees on campus and working in ways that we can make the university function better. There's uh, service um, within the profession. So I'm an editor at a few journals, so um, I handle submissions of journal papers, and I handle that. I get them refereed. I help decide whether or not they should be accepted to the journal, make sure they're up to the editorial standards. and. Uh, well-written papers. Then there's broader service to the community. So for example, one of the things I do, I serve as a judge for the Regeneron Science Talent Search. So it's a very well-known um, science competition and I'm one of the math judges for that contest. And there's other things uh, that we can do. We give lectures sometimes to the community or to, we you know, more often um, within the university to different clubs that are interested. So there's a lot of different aspects of service that you can take into. So those are the three main aspects of the job. <laughs> So algebraic number theory encompasses a lot, but one of the central motivating questions in algebraic number theory is how do we solve equations with solutions that are rational numbers or integers? So the first example of this that we usually see in school is the Pythagorean equation. So x squared plus y squared equals z squared, or x, y, and z are integers. And the reason we think of this as an interesting equation is that it has a geometric interpretation. So the Pythagorean theorem is that if x and y and z satisfy this a relationship that x squared plus y squared equals z squared, then that means that there's a right triangle where the legs have sides x and y and the hypotenuse has size z. So we're kind of interested in, in knowing the answer to this geometric question and then we turn it into an algebraic question. And then we can think about this equation x squared plus y squared equals z squared and we can try to solve it and we might be interested in what kind of triangles that are right triangles have integer sides. So there's some famous solutions to this equation like 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared and 5 squared plus 12 squared equals 13 squared. But you might want to ask, can we generate all the solutions? Can I write down a formula that tells me all the triples x, y, and z such that x, y, and z are positive integers and x squared plus y squared is equal to z squared? And you can do that. And um, this is one of the first examples of a problem in the field that's called arithmetic geometry. So the reason this question um, is really fascinating, or the solution to this question is fascinating, is that, um, as I mentioned, you use geometry to solve it. So first you take x squared plus y squared equals z squared. And if you divide out by z squared, then it becomes x over z squared plus y over z squared equals 1. And if you graph what you know, one variable squared plus another variable squared equals one looks like in the plane, then that's just a circle. And so what you're really asking is, what are all the points on that circle that have rational coordinates? And then you use some, some nice geometry to solve that question. And so it's a nice blend of geometry and, and algebra to give a solution to this equation. And if you work it all out, then what you get actually is a total solution to that original Pythagorean equation. So the Pythagorean equation has a solution. That means that we can plug in a formula to give us all the solutions. Now answering that question for more complicated equations, for example, if the equations have degree three, uh, you get a cubic equations. Those are still big open questions in number theories, how to solve those. And so we have some kind of proposed solutions, but we don't know whether they always work. So that, those are the type of questions that number theorists think about and the type of questions that I think about. Um, I can actually say it pretty definitively the time I decided I wanted to go math. So be, before I get to that point, I'll say that I was actually really interested in, I don't know, humanities. I was interested in literature, really, like writing. I was a big reader when I was a kid. 
So um, I would like write stories. And so I kind of was more headed in that direction. But then I started going to math summer programs when I was younger. So I got really interested in STEM then. I got introduced to computer programming and there's some mathematical aspects. I remember I studied some aspects of fractals and bifurcation and wrote some computers or programs related to the Mandelbrot set. And this is when I was um, pretty young, like nine, 10 years old. But I don't think I was set on being a mathematician or even necessarily in STEM at that point. I still had a pretty broad range. But then uh, one summer, I went to a number theory program in uh, the Ohio State University called the Ross Young Scholars Program. I think I was around 12 when I went to that program. But um, I totally fell in love with mathematics. So it's kind of funny because I fell in love with number theory at that point. Um, that was my first exposure to number theory. And it was a really rigorous program. So we did real proofs and I sort of fell in love with the whole concept of doing proofs and I fell in love with the material. And I kind of decided that I want to be a number theorist at that point when I was 12. And it's kind of been a straight line since then. Um, I know that's not a maybe a very uh, exciting story. Again, it's not the only story. There's lots of people that have very different paths to becoming a mathematician that go through art and music and being a magician for a while, or I know a mathematician that was a taxi cab driver for a while. So you don't have to have a straight line from when you're 12, but uh, that turns out to be, have been my story. So at that point I became really interested. I started getting more into math contests. So I did math Olympiad, you know, sort of did better and better every year. So by my senior year in high school, I was one of the winners of the US Math Olympiad. So I kept doing math and science programs every summer and focused on it during the year also. And, you know, just majored in math when I went to, to college and have um, never really looked back. So I should say that I did, you know, expand my other interests. And I spent a year after I graduated from college doing some economics for a year. But even then, I kind of knew that um, I was going to go back to math. It was the point of that year was to have fun for one year before I went back to math. There was never really a, a thinking that I might, you know, go off in another direction, but um, it, it, it's always good to expand your horizons, even if you're focused on what your main goal is. I would say that the reason I do my job is for the research component. I love thinking about math. I love thinking about um, these unsolved problems that are out there that are just fascinating to me and thinking about these beautiful structures that govern um, classical number theory questions. And I love just thinking about it. Like my favorite thing, in the world is to just be like sitting on my like couch, whether it's my office couch or my home office couch. <laughs> um, that's where I do my thinking and just like staring at the ceiling and thinking about math. That's like my favorite thing in the world to do. But I'll be honest with you, if that was all I did, it would be um, a, a lonely and I think difficult profession to handle because that sounds like a pretty isolating thing, right? To be staring, sitting on your couch, staring at the ceiling all the time. So the other aspects of the profession are really important. So for one thing, even within research, I collaborate. Almost all of my papers are collaborative and I love that. There's a social aspect and I've made lots of great friendships with my collaborators and, and peers and, and my you know advisors and my students, so at, at every level. Um, but then going beyond research, I really do love the interaction with students and the teaching. So teaching courses, working with graduate students, working with individual students on research projects. There's a lot of different aspects of teaching and, and I really love the interactions. I can, um, really thank all my teachers and advisors for, for, you know, conveying to me their passion for the field, which I now have. And I love transferring that on to the next generation. So that's something that I really value. Beyond that kind of high level idea of why I value it, just personally, it's fun. Like it's fun interacting with students. It's fun teaching things. It's fun, you know, presenting some mathematics that you find is beautiful. It's fun seeing someone learn something for the first time that is really beautiful and seeing them appreciate its beauty. Um, it really means a lot to me when students write to me saying that my course like inspired them to go on to a career in STEM that really provides you know, some meaning to my day-to-day -day job. So there's a lot of aspects of the profession that I, that I really love. It's not one thing. There's two aspects of that. So one is you have to love what it is that you're studying and really find beauty in it. Otherwise, you're not gonna to continue to have the passion to, to work in the field. And the second aspect is to realize that it's subjective and there's a culture at play 
And so it's good to get exposed to the current culture of the field and to understand what types of things people think are interesting and why they think they're interesting so that you can kind of focus on interesting questions. And again, that itself has two aspects. Is you don't want to place yourself in a box. You want to be able to think outside of the box and do something different that other people aren't doing. But at the same time, you don't want to be on an island where no one cares about what you're doing. You can make art for yourself and enjoy it, but um, somehow art uh, is better if it's more widely appreciated, I think. And, I, and mathematics in a lot of ways is an art. We, we do it for the purpose of sort of presenting beautiful solutions to problems and hoping that other people appreciate their beauty. <laughs> I guess I would say is having a broad perspective on the field and the culture of the field and having good taste in understanding what are the interesting questions is something that's valuable. And at the same time, holding on to your individuality and your creativity and trying to break new ground that's beyond what other people are thinking about, what other people um, are telling you is what you should be thinking about. So, so try to maintaining that balance between those two factors, I think, it, um, and realizing when you're swaying too far in one direction, sort of having the advice to, to think about that consciously when you're approaching problems is something that I would have maybe wanted to, to realize earlier than I did in my career. So the day of a professor is very varied. I would typically drop my daughter off at school around eight and come to the department and then because it's, it's eight in the morning and there's not necessarily a lot of people there, I just try to spend the first few hours just focusing on research because that's when you can get research done before the knocks on your door start, start happening. So, you know, between eight and 10, I might, you know, spend two hours or maybe if I have a little bit more time doing research in the morning. And then once everyone shows up at the department, then the day is usually a whirlwind. So I'll just give you a sample day just to make up what a day might be. Okay, so then from 10 to 11, I teach a class. Uh, 11 to 12, I meet with a postdoc. And then at 12 to 1, I have lunch. And maybe that lunch is with the number theory group because we have a seminar that day. If we do have a visiting speaker, maybe I talk to that speaker for half an hour to an hour about the research and my research. And we bounce ideas off each other until 2. And then at two, I have some editorial work to do. So I log on to my computer and I check out all the papers that have been submitted and I try to find referees for them. Maybe I have a referee request for, for myself and I'm reading a paper that I have to read and edit it. Then at, at three, we have um, our seminar. So I go to the seminar for an hour. And then, you know, at four, <laughs> I have a meeting with a grad student. So that might be one day. And then the, another, the next day, you might do completely separate aspects of the job that I didn't even mention. So I'll have office hours for my class. And then I'll meet with students. You know, there might be a student that wants to meet with me because they're struggling or you know, interested in something. And like I said, there's a lot of service. So you might have to serve on a committee and the university. Or, so, so there's always things going on. And I would say during the chunk, middle chunk of that day, there's always people knocking at your door. There's always things that you have to do. You're getting emails about letters that you have to write, especially during letter writing season in the fall. You, you spend like several hours a week just writing recommendation letters. So there's certainly, there's many aspects of the job that people don't really uh, appreciate how much time it takes. Math has a lot of applications beyond the academic world. Most people who use math in their jobs are not research mathematicians at universities because math is used all over, um, especially nowadays. There's so many tech companies, so many finance companies that are all using math in, in a huge way. Now, I think when you're in high school, you don't have to you know, focus that much on it. You just you know, learn the mathematics and, and, and decide later what aspect or what avenue you want to take to turn it into a career. The simplest recommendation is just to follow what you love. Make sure you're studying and learning about things that are really interesting that you could see yourself being passionate about or hopefully you already are passionate about, you know, and trying to find something to fall in love with academically, whether it's math or anything else. Because the people that are the most successful are the people that love what they do. <laughs> and, and unless you really find it really in intellectually stimulating to you unless you it really like get something in you like satisfies some some need that you have then you're not going to really um, be able to commit yourself with the passion for it that you're going to need to get like a phd the biggest conjecture in mathematics i'll say is the Riemann hypothesis 
And um, I would love to see that proven in my lifetime. Closer to what I think about, there's a conjecture called the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture, which has to do to the solution of to cubic equations, and those are called elliptic curves. And there's a big conjecture, which was stated by two mathematicians named Birch and Swinnerton Dyer. And that's the kind of foundational question in that subfield. And it would be awesome if that was proven. That would be like the biggest breakthrough that I'd have seen during my sort of career as a mathematician, if either of those gets, gets proven. We'll see if any progress on that is made during my lifetime. <laughs>